So, for a few moments, we will uh, look to a passage that I believe is very familiar. Um, last week, we looked at Psalm 48, and we looked at the, the, the correlation of Psalm 48 to uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 32, because Psalm 48 was rejoicing as a result of what happened in 2 Chronicles and many times. We read uh, scripture in isolation, and so we, we benefit from it nevertheless because the Word of God says it will never return to him void. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and the Word of God is able to, to reach our hearts, no matter if we read it in isolation or in context, out of context. But when we preach, we like to, to kind of educate I, I like to do more educate than entertain, but some people like to do more entertain than educate, so you're stuck with me. Uh, but, but what we want is to, to, to get to understand the scriptures as best we can, or let the Lord and the Holy Spirit enlighten us. The scriptures, you know, we can read the, you'll get bored, but you can read the same scripture every day, 365 days, and get a blessing every day for 365 days. Even if that scripture is the shortest scripture in the Bible, because you will start weeping before you know it, if you keep reading Jesus way, Jesus way. Eventually, eventually you will start weeping too. So it will have no meaning for you if it's over some time. Uh, today we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 12, which was read earlier, the first three verses. So I want to read that again to, to, to get you on board. And says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition for sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And there's a whole bunch of messages in those three verses. And I always have said, especially when I speak from a passage like this, it starts with a connecting word. Uh, and anything that starts with a connecting word loses its meaning if you don't know what is connected. So, you know, these conjunctions, and, and, but, and those words, therefore, uh, when I was in school, they told me every time you see therefore, you should ask, what is it there for? Because it's there for some purpose. And what chapter 12 is doing is connecting you to chapter 11. Now everybody knows chapter 11 in some way or shape or form because you know chapter 11 verse 1. What does it say? Faith, substance of things, hope for, evidence of things not seen. We, we, that's at least one verse of the Bible that we were saying more than a few weeks. We, we learned that. But it's important for us because chapter 12 is building on your knowledge of the, the role that faith plays in our lives and in our Christian experience. So what we came before was first a definition of faith from the very first verse. It tells you what faith is. I'm reading it in the NIV and it says that it's confidence in what we hope. Most of us hope without confidence. I hope that the church was warm today. I did not have any confidence. <laughs> no faith. I, I hope to see certain people today. I just hope. Some of you are here that I hope to see, and some, some are not here that I hope to see. And there are also some people that I didn't hope to see that are here. Praise the Lord for all of you. But the definition of faith is not that you just say, I believe. A 
lot of people like to, 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 to just say faith is believing. You know, when you teach your two-year-old or your four-year-old, you might stop at that. But, but we are way beyond the two in the kindergarten stage. So faith is not just believing. Because you can believe a whole lot of mess and it's not faith. So faith is confidence in what we hope, but it's also confidence in who we hope. Yes. See, our hope is not in a thing, it's not in our religious beliefs, it's not in the Church of God traditions and, and Church of God doctrine. Our hope is in Jesus. And if you read Hebrews 11, you will see that Abraham and all the patriarchs met Jesus and followed Jesus. And so the reason why Hebrews 11 exists, one of the reasons is to give us this whole litany of great people yes, yes. that have trusted God. And starting with Abraham, who is our father, earthly father, so to speak. And, and, and Abraham grew up in a household that did not believe in or know who God Jehovah was. So talking about having to have faith, he had to have faith because he didn't even know who he was having faith in. But it tends to, to let us as we stop and think for a moment, if Abraham was heathen, we don't want to say atheist, he was heathen. He believed in some God, his people believed in some God, but it wasn't in Jehovah. How, how is it possible for him to get to be the father of faith and to trust in this person that he doesn't know? And then you're going to go all the way back to Genesis, because in Genesis, God says, when he stretched out on that mold of dirt, that he laid on that mold of dirt that he formed, and he said, man became a living soul, not being. He says, let there be, and all the beings came, but he didn't say, let there be for man. God did a special thing in creating man, and what he did that's extra special is he laid on the foundation of man, and he breathed himself into man. So Abraham had God in him without knowing who God was. And so because God was in him, at the opportune time, God could speak to him, and God could challenge him, and he was obedient in faith, and he became the richest man to ever walk this earth. There's nobody yet to this day who has been as rich or could ever be as rich as Abraham. Remember, you can't count his people. Can you count the stars in the sky? No. Can you count the sands or the, uh, the, the grains of sand? No, you can't. And his people is greater than that. His, his people are still alive today. I told you last week I got to sit down with this um, Muslim person and he went all the way back to Abraham. That's why you know that, that yes, we are kind of opposite, dual in faith. But the root besides Jesus goes all the way back to the same Abraham. And I think it's just fantastic. It's fantastic that therefore, in this world, when you break down this world, there's only two real religions. Now, I know, I know those of you who went to college will prove me wrong right away. But it's either the Christian faith or the Muslim faith. That's, that's the two basic religions in the world. That those doesn't account for more than 90% of the people in the world, the religious people. And, and believe it or not, Christians, you are outnumbered. They got a lot more Muslims than Christians. So you think that you got a lot of Christians, which, which are really fantastic because we are all over the world, but there's a lot more Muslims and they believe in Father Abraham. And they believe he's the father of faith. And they believe that he walked away from their God, their beliefs, his father's beliefs, and that he was blessed by being obedient because he heard God and followed him. We believe the same thing. Amen. 
So faith chapter chapter 11 just gives us a whole litany. Uh, you, 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 you got some people in there that you forgot, but they talk about Enoch. I mean, they go through, you, you name it. Go and read uh, Hebrew chapter 11, and you see all the top, these are the big dogs in faith. I mean, you can't get any bigger names than the people in, in, in Hebrew chapter 11. And after he's established two things in Hebrews 11 that I like to talk about, one is the definition of faith, and one is the proposition of faith. That is our faith in verse 6. It is impossible to please God. So he, he, he tells you what faith is, and he tells you without that thing, you can't please God. So faith in the King James Version is the, is the evidence of things that you don't see. I can't see it, I don't yet have it, but I'm going to behave. See, faith demands how you behave. That, that's why James comes along long after and says, faith without words is dead. Yeah. Because I can't have faith by just being a philosopher. I'm talking about faith, like, like I know something about faith and I can discuss all the stuff about faith and I can dress and look like faith and I still don't know what faith is. Faith is not just what's up here in your head, but it's what's down here in your heart. And it's what motivates you. Because of faith, you will speak to a mountain and it will move because it has to obey the word of God. Because of faith, you will speak to things in your family that's not right at this time. You've got sons and daughters and parents and siblings and all the other stuff that's going on. It is not right at this time. What you see doesn't look right, but faith is confidence that what you see is not all that matters, but what he sees is what matters. Because faith is about the relationship with God. It's not about us. Yes, I have faith, but without God, my faith is not worth anything. And without faith, I can't even get to God. I can't please Him. I can't do what He wants. So faith is action. Yes, I believe it, but there's two parts to it, right? So in the, in the NIV, the word is confidence and assurance. Confidence in what we hope and assurance and what we don't see. See, I, I have assurance from God. I believe so much. That this is what made me simplify and say faith and believe it. I believe so much. I believe God is going to heal me. I believe God is going to save my children. I believe God is going to make things better for me in my neighborhood or my community or my job or whatever. Whatever my problem is, I believe it. But I won't say like some two-year-old, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, and think that if you say it 150 times, it's going to happen. <laughs> it is that you actually don't just believe it, but you start living as though it has happened. So if I want to believe for something that I don't see, I gotta start walking as though I have what I don't see. And, and that's where faith really comes in, faith and works. You want to get this, you gotta start working. I can believe that I'm gonna win the lottery all day long, but I need to first buy a ticket. <laughs> okay? You know, there's a guy who went to God and, and chastised God because he wanted to be win the lottery. He said, God, I can't. I have faith in him. I still haven't won the lottery, and the story says God says, Do me a favor, buy a ticket. <laughs> you gotta do something, you gotta have some works along with your faith. If you don't buy a ticket, that's what, see, that's the crazy people who believe stuff just because they wanna say stuff. But God is saying, No, 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 no. Show me that you really believe. What he said to Abraham, gather all of your stuff. And leave your current surroundings. I can't bless you right here. Some of us need to get out of our comfort area because God can't bless us because we are not in the place where we will be blessed. Now I'm not telling you to go home and start saying to your wife, I'm gone because <laughs> Pastor says I'm not in the right place. <laughs> don't, don't use me to do wrong, please. But but sometimes we're in the wrong place. Sometimes you're in the wrong church. But not this 
Lord. They're the wrong church. You need to get out so that they will be blessed with the stuff that they're teaching you and right. Sometimes you, you, you are just not in the right relationship. You want God to bless you, but you know that you are not in the right relationship with your significant person. Or with your parent. Or with your sibling. God, God wants to bless you, but you better start making it right with that relationship if you want God to bless that relationship. You know, I, I was in college and I took this, uh, this course with this great theologian. And uh, his big thing was on reconciliation of siblings with their parents. I don't know if he suffered something like that. He never exposed his feelings to it. But he made us right about our relationship, especially males. And there was, at that time in my class, there were more males than females. But it didn't matter because we all had the same assignment. But yeah, he made us right about our relationship with our fathers. And if there were girls, their relationship with their fathers. And still went with fathers. And everybody was fathers. He had a purpose for that. And then he says, what are you going to do about it? See, some people can write, oh, my father left us when I was two. I don't even know who my father was. Or my father this, my father that. And he says, okay, what are you going to do about it? He says, you cannot be as successful as God wants you to be if you don't make it right with your father. That was the point he would make. Many of us bring all that baggage into marriages and then the marriages don't work as well as they should either because you didn't make it right. God says for this reason should you leave your parents and cleave to each other. But sometimes you didn't leave yet because you still got baggage that you're bringing. You didn't really make a good decision in leaving. Now this is, that's your free lesson for all of you who have marital problems. I will not charge you for that. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance that, that what we hope for will come to pass. I have to believe that God will save and keep my kids safe. I can tell you before we had, we have two boys now so I can say that, I didn't know what it would have been then. But before we had any children, we prayed for our children and we prayed for their salvation. That's before my wife told me that I hit the bullseye. <laughs> I had to still wait till it came into fruition. But faith was believing, even before I had children, that I was first going to have children, because it's not a given. And then secondly, that God's hands would be upon them. But there had to be works. My children didn't get saved because I believed they would be saved. My children got saved because I lived a life before them, because I put them in Christian school when I could hardly afford it, because I, I because the nerve of those children to look at me and tell me the car is changing. And I said, well, if I take you out of school, I can buy a new car. <laughs> the nerve of these kids to tell me like, my car is too old. <laughs> I'm here suffering with a hoopty so that they can get Christian education and they're, t they're ragging on my car. The same car that was taking them to school. Yeah, it was 14 years old, but who cares? But faith is believing that my children will make the choice. I remember because, I didn't do this because of one of my kids um, experience in middle school. This is away from high school. Now all you wonderful people, you did your job. Thank you so much. Because, because believe me, my children are saved today because of all of you who were here as my children were growing up. And I don't want to call any names because I'm going to miss one and that person is going to be mad at me. So all of you, I thank you. But now they weren't even here anymore. But a teacher gave my son a car, and it was called an ABM car. 
Back then, it was automated banking and machine cards. That's your bank card today, or whatever you call it today, your debit card. At first, it was called automated banking machine card. But he gave me this card, and it says ABM on it, it looks like a bank card, but it says abstinence before marriage. Give my son an ABM card when he was in middle school. Mm. And told him to carry that card, put it in his wallet, and carry that card until he got married. So when my son left home and left Philadelphia, and I couldn't touch him anymore, I could tell him, I could ask him, do you still carry your ABM card? <laughs> he could lie to me. But are you still a card carrying member of the ABM group? <laughs> because, because you have to do some work. You, you want your children saved by you buying them everything that comes out on the market and not even looking at it to see what is offering them. And then you let them watch TV all night long and wondering why they're not doing the things you want them to do. No. You, you want to be a good Christian, but all you do, but you never read the Bible? How are you going to be a good Christian without reading the Bible? You're supposed to read the Bible every day. But you want to be a good Christian. Lord, I want to make, make me, use me, mold me after your will. Yes, Lord. Then, you, you know, you don't, you don't read the Word. You don't come to church. Once a month is great. You know, I put in my time. As I say, I put in my dues, and I do as I please. <laughs> Faith must have works. So when you understand the faith story, then you can move on and say, therefore, say that all these great people that have gone before, Abraham, Isaac, all the way down, Enoch, all the way down, say that all these great people have successfully lived before the Lord. And as a matter of fact, say that they have lived Christian lives without the Holy Spirit's individuality. Understand that. None of these people have the Holy Spirit in them. Jesus had not yet come in the form that in the flesh. Jesus had not yet died, which is all the faith journey that, that made it so that we can make it. And, and Jesus had not yet ascended and had not yet sent the Holy Spirit. And all these people, all of them, these are the cloud of witnesses that are now up in heaven cheering you on. So therefore, seeing that we are surrounded by such great love of witnesses, the least we can do is to stop messing up. It says three things that I'll get to soon. First, lay aside, throw off, and it says throw off everything, not some of the things that hinder you. Again, that's the problem with our modern day Christians. We are so modern day that we pick and choose, you know, like 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 when you go to a buffet table. I don't, I don't like this, but I like that, so I'll take that, I'll take that, I'll no, no. I have a I have a I have an adult friend who will not eat a vegetable. So you can give him all the healthy food and he will not choose a vegetable. He just doesn't believe it. And some of you are Christians who don't eat your vegetables. God has put some vegetables there for you, but you want nuggets. You want the fried stuff. You want the quick stuff. The stuff that you just drop it in and you take it out. That's what you want. You want, you want, to, you want to grow up to be the greatest Christian in the world by eating nuggets. I don't think that that's going to work. God says eat the whole word, not just a nugget, not just a sound bite. You know, we got Christians in this world that they only know sound bites. They only know what sounds good to, to other Christians. So you come upon them and they can tell you a few things, you know. They can, first of all, you know, if they're black and you say God is good, they're going to say all the time. <laughs> That's a sound bite. 
Is God, is God really good all the time to you? Because when you're going through, are you saying God is good? When your loved ones disappoint you, are you saying God is good? When your children abandon you and disown you, are you saying God is good? When the job fires you, are you saying God is good? You gotta believe that God is good all the time, no matter what happens. You gotta believe that, that, that if you have walked before the Lord, and you have put your faith in the Lord, and you have done the works that you can do, that God has promised that He will see to it, that with all the power that He has, that your will will be done, not just His will. Because he, he promises to give you the desires of your heart. No good thing will He withhold from those who walk uprightly. But we like the no good thing will give us hope. Good, we stop. But we're not walking uprightly, but we still want Him to not withhold any good thing from us. You can't get peace of God, the peace that you like, and not the rest of God that He has given you. All things don't work together for the good. Everybody loves that. These are the nuggets, the sound bites that you guys like to eat on and don't want to eat any word. All things work together for the good. Is that true? I don't think so. I really don't think so. You've got to understand the whole verse and the verses that are surrounding it. If you're walking according to God's calling, then everything that happens to you, He will turn it into good if it's not good when it starts. It might start off not good, but He will make it into good. But you got to do the works. You've got to be walking after righteousness. Lay aside we don't have a whole lot of time to go into all of this, but lay aside everything in the one hand. Lay aside everything that hinders you. All the stuff that hinders you. If TV hinders you, lay aside. If playing the numbers hinders you, lay aside. Move your toes, I'm coming to <laughs> If watching certain shows, we got young people in here, lay aside. If getting a whiff of certain things, lay it aside. Amen. If getting a sip of certain things, lay it aside. I don't know. I don't know who's going to be left in here, Sister B. I'll soon be looking up. I'll look up with my nose and I'll look up and look at it. Wow. written in what, 70s, 80s, so this is over 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years ago. Um, look at what runners wear today. Runners don't wear any clothes. The design suits are body design now. I, rem I, I, you know, I remember wearing some baggy pants when I was running down the lane trying to win a race. Nobody wearing baggy pants when they're running now. That's, that's stuff that you got to lay aside your baggy pants. That's going to hold you back. You can't win if you got baggy pants on. I remember running in some heavy shoes. No, you can't run in heavy shoes. You got to put on shoes that feel like socks. Lay aside everything that would hinder you. And then be and the sin that entangles you. See, it's not all sin. There's other stuff that's not sin, but you still got to lay it aside. Yes. And then, in case you think that you were done because you lay aside some of those things, watch for the sin. Because some sin is entangled in you. Some of us keep getting past the sin only to get entangled in it again. You know? Like the sin of death. We go, we do a bankruptcy, we get zero. We're clear. Two years later, we owe everybody a campaign. And lay aside all the things that will hinder you and the sin 
itself that will hinder sin. Sin. The reason why why you 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 have a, a sin of debt is because debt is not a sin, but your eyes is a sin. Remember, there's a sin with your eyes. Everything you see, you want. And so you take it, that card, and this card, and the next card, and you got five or six cards, and you max them out. Because everything you see, you must have. That's not what the Lord said. So your sin is not the debt. Because when we wipe out that debt, that sin is still there. The sin is not being able to trust God. To believe, to have faith that you can do it. You know, take some, even some of the same people that's willing to, to, to give you a car tells you you should pay it off every month. Even there, even there, see, they know that it's a sin. Just like gambling. Gambling is a sin. And the gambling itself is not as much a sin as what's coming up out of you. I thought I was impervious to gambling because I've never been a gambler. Never. And when I had no money, I lost $200 with somebody doing some crazy stuff, making me think I could win $20, another $20. What happens is it gets into you. And it gets into you, just the idea that, and you win, you win, you win, you know, you win a couple of dollars and say, oh, but you can walk away, but I can double it. Try it again. And it rises up. The sin that's in you is what's rising up now because, because we think that we don't have to work to get fucked, to get paid. So the sin is greed. Yes. And you get sucked into that sin. That's why the, I had this lady that I worked with when I used to park cars years ago before my kids were born. And she had every number in the book written down. <laughs> and if she dreamed a certain dream, it had another number. Every day she played the numbers. And she didn't play one number, she played a lot of numbers. And she has one special number. And she could tell every time for the last 10 years that her number came up. But guess what? She didn't play that number. <laughs> <laughs> and you would think she would learn the lesson that she ain't going to be rich. That number isn't going to work for her. But she's been playing it. I don't know if she's alive now. If she's alive now, she's been playing it for more than 30 years. The sin is not that you play it, that you buy a lot of retail. You can buy a lot of retail. You go tell the pastor say you can buy a lot of retail. The pastor is telling you, if you believe in that lot of retail, that's the sin. If you think that, if your hope is in Christ. Your hope is not in the Pennsylvania lottery or the New Jersey lottery or any of these big lotteries that come out. If you start moving yourself away from your hope being in the Lord, that's the sin. Yeah. So if you think you can gamble and still be believing in God, that's between you and God. I will never get between you two. Secondly, run patiently with perseverance. Patiently. The thing is, we don't have patience when we run. See, we think it's a, a sprint. Sprinters don't have patience. They just take off and they move. This race is not a sprint. This race is a marathon. Yes. If you start off this race sprinting, I guarantee you, you're going to run out of speed really fast. And the people that you pass at the beginning of the race will all pass you way before you get to halfway in this race. So the marathon is 26 plus miles. If you start off running with all you have, I don't think you're going to last a month before people, before I start to pass you. <laughs> Even I will pass you. Run with perseverance. This race, this belief that, that, that since we have this great cloud of witnesses and that faith is the anchor for us, it takes some patience. God is going to just do a little, you know, he's, he's not a magic one person that's just going to say, hey, you go. I have to pray. I still pray for my boys. I think my boys are saved and are saved as I can testify. But that's not the end. I'm still praying for my boys. And now I'm praying for my grandchildren. My boys. Pray for my grandchildren. Faith is believing that even though Michael hasn't introduced me to his girlfriend, so I don't know who she is, I 
and he's not married, so I don't know when that's going to happen. But I am going to be a grandpa, and I'm going to be able to share God's blessing with my grandchildren. That's my faith. If you don't believe it, talk to me 10 years from now when I'm boxing a little bit. I have run in with perseverance. I have perseverance that this is going to happen. My kids are going to have kids, and I'm going to be a pro grandpa. Right. I don't know what they're going to call me, but whatever they call me, I'm going to be there. I'm looking forward. I already did all the hard work. So don't think now that I'm, I'm looking forward to spoiling some kids and sending them home. <laughs> So therefore, since we are surrounded by all of these wonderful people, 
And we can add some more to pioneers to them because we've got some people like Brother Brandon, who I know was a man of faith. This is a person that I met, that I walk with, that I talk to. And you know a whole lot of other people who have gone home to the Lord that you can testify that they walk by faith. And since they are all this part of this cloud of witnesses, if they can make it, if Christ can do it for them, he can do it for you. Just walk by faith, not just by sight. Amen. 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 Let's go ahead. Father, we thank you for your, your word is true. We thank you for your anointing upon this place and upon our time that we spent together in your presence. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you will, you will be magnified. Your word will go forth and that others will be blessed. So now, Lord, speak to us. Speak to our hearts. And be real for us. So that what we believe will be what you have encouraged us to believe. And what we trust in will be the, the good things that you have told us to trust in. And that we will be patient. Wait patiently on you. Knowing that you are the author, finisher, and perfecter of our faith. Bless us now, we pray. Amen. Before we go, if there's anyone who has something that you've been praying for. Maybe it's a long-term thing. You've been praying for it, kind of slacked off. Maybe it's back in focus again. We want to pray with you today. Uh, we, want to, we want to help encourage you. So what I want to do is, you know, you don't have to come up. Raise your hand where you are. If, you're, if you want us to pray for you today, raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. We want to pray for you. Yes. You know what you stand in need of. We're going to pray for you because our God is able. Thank you. We're going to pray that, that Jehovah, the righteous, will honor your faith. So what your yes. first name is put into practice. You may have thought that you did everything, but there may be one more thing you can do. Let the Holy Spirit guide you. Saints, join with me as we pray. Lord, we thank you for those who raise their hands. To say that they pray for something, some work that needs to be done that can only be done by you. Some victory that needs to be won through your grace. We thank you for your word and your promises, Lord. And we pray that those who have raised their hand will walk patiently, will persevere, will not give up, will not let go, but will allow you to have your way. And that they will walk in faith, believing that they will stand on your promise that, that they will not just cave in and say, well, maybe it was your will, that they will stand up and allow you, Lord, there's a song we've sung before, standing on the promises of God. Let us remember those promises that you made. Let us remember the power that you are. And so let us call on you and believe that you will hear and that's our so Lord, we thank you for the answers for those who have raised their hand. And even for those who haven't raised their hand, but in their hearts they've said, Lord, remember me. We give it to you, Lord. We let go and we love you to have your mighty way. In your name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Amen.